Let's talk about 20 questions. This simple game, needing only two players and a common language between them, has fascinated players since its inception in the 19th century, even going so far as to inspire a popular 1949 game show with the same name. The players start by deciding on a category. Historically, a variety of categories have proven entertaining, but let's go with animals for now since it's a classic. One player, which we'll call the responder, will now choose an animal at random and keep it to himself as a secret, and it's the job of the other player, the questioner, to guess this animal by asking a sequence of yes or no questions. If he's able to figure it out in 20 questions or less, the questioner wins. This little game is a fun way to pass the time with a friend, but it could stand to be a little more interesting. In a game of 20 questions, it's assumed that the responder will always answer truthfully, otherwise they're a cheater. However, let's say that we introduce a challenge for the questioner and allow the responder to lie for just one of their answers. They can lie on their first question, the last question, or any question in between. They could even choose not to lie at all. But once they use up their one lie, the rest of their answers must be truthful. 20 questions, along with this additional rule, is called Ulam's game. So we might ask ourselves, what's the best way to win Ulam's game? It's this question that we'll spend the rest of this video exploring. Now, you might have already spotted a problem. If we don't know which of the answers is a lie, then we can't trust any of them. But each question in a game depends on knowledge we collect from previous answers, so it seems like there's no way forward. We could easily combat this by simply asking each question twice. After all, the responder can only lie once, so it would be instantly recognizable should they choose to use their lie, since the answers wouldn't match up. But if you're thinking that this doesn't sound like the most efficient strategy, you'd be right. It's far from optimal. However, when problem solving, it often proves fruitful to ride a train of thought that you know is distant from your goal if there's any chance it could help illuminate something clever about the problem you're trying to solve. A master problem solver will often search for a simplification of the problem they are working on in hopes that its solution will hint at some greater truth. In this case, considering only the question duplication strategy allows us to completely disregard the possibility of a lie. If we can find the best strategy for a regular game of 20 questions, we know we can construct from it an approximation of the best strategy for Ulam's game. Now that we know we're looking for the best 20 question strategy, we have to wonder, what exactly makes a strategy the best one? We're looking for a strategy that's somehow better than every other possibility, so given two strategies A and B, we'll need some way to compare the two. We might say that strategy A is better than strategy B if strategy A allows the questioner to win in less questions than strategy B. But there's a problem with defining it this way. Let's say our strategy is that we simply name an animal and ask if it's the chosen one, and continue naming animals until we accidentally guess the right one. If you get lucky, you can win the game in just one question, making it a great strategy if we're sticking strictly to our definition. But it's intuitively hot garbage to borrow from scientific terminology. Sure, it allows us to win quickly, but it also has the possibility to draw out the game for an effective eternity. So what we really want is a strategy that guarantees a win in the smallest amount of questions. Instead of comparing best case scenarios for possible strategies, we'll compare worst case scenarios. Now that we have the beginnings of a game plan, there's one last simplification we can make that is going to make our lives one heck of a lot easier. We don't want to have to worry about the specifics of which animals have which traits, and we don't want to have to break out the biology textbooks and search for stupidly specific questions to ask either. So let's say we take every animal and give it a number. Then we could just ask our questions about the numbers instead of the animals assigned to them. Once we find the correct number, then we simply refer to our assignments and we know the animal. One of the main advantages of this approach is that it doesn't matter what our starting category is. We can just take everything in a category and give it a number. So the only thing making one category different from another is the number of items in each. For the rest of this video, I'm going to just keep it simple and assume that the category is the numbers between and including 1 and 15, just so that I can fit them all on the screen. Fret not, however, the analysis we're going to go through is going to easily carry over to any category size. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, we can finally get on to some serious problem solving. Keeping with our game plan, we're now going to take a crack at discovering the 20 question strategy with the shortest worst case scenario. If you're already familiar with binary search trees and already know the best strategy here, you can go ahead and skip to this point in the video where we get back to Ulam's game. But for the rest of us, what we're going to talk about now is going to be very important to understanding what comes later. 
So without further ado, let's get into the meat and potatoes of how to actually fully define a strategy. At the beginning of the game, we haven't ruled anything out, so we'll represent our lack of knowledge with 15 numbered balls, one for each number we haven't yet ruled out. We want to start narrowing down the possibilities, so we decide on a question to ask. Right now it doesn't matter what question we ask because we're just trying to get a feel on what makes a strategy tick. So without thinking too hard, maybe we want to know if the number is prime. The responder can now potentially answer either yes or no. We'll represent this with two branches from the colored balls. If they answer yes, we know that the secret number has to be prime, so we'll move the prime numbers into the yes branch. But if they answer no, then we know the secret number can't be prime, so we'll put all the rest of the balls into the no branch. This gives us a nice visual representation of exactly what we know in each case. Of course, now we have to decide on a second question to ask. Since each possibility leaves us with different discovered information, we might want to ask a different question for each case. Each of these questions splits the possibilities again. So after moving our numbered balls, we see that we will find ourselves in one of four possibilities after two questions. What we have here is a map of exactly the information we have at every point in the game so far. For example, if the responder tells us that our number is not prime, but is greater than 5, we know that these are the numbers that could still potentially be the secret number. Or, if we find out that the number is prime, and then we find out it's even, then the only remaining possibility for the secret number is 2, since 2 is the only even prime number. So in this case, we don't have to ask any more questions, but we still need more information for all the other states, so we continue asking questions until no more splits are necessary. When we filled out our entire diagram, we've defined a complete strategy accounting for every possible turn the game could take. This map we've drawn out is called a binary search tree. The collections of numbered balls are called nodes, and the winning nodes are called leaves. Now let's look at just one of the balls at the beginning of the game and trace its path. Because for every question on its journey it can never satisfy both the yes and the no answer, then there is only one possible path the ball can take. This means there is just one and only one leaf that contains that ball. Since we can say this about every ball here, we can say with confidence that there are exactly 15 leaves, one for each number in the starting state. More importantly, this argument can be made about any strategy we could imagine, so we know that the optimal strategy has 15 leaves. The best strategy, as we've already discussed, is the strategy with the best worst case scenario. In the context of the tree, the worst case scenario is just the longest possible path. So we can pretty easily construct the shape of the best 20 question strategy, even if we don't know the proper questions just yet. We could just build up the shortest tree we can possibly make with 15 leaves. We know what the leaves are going to be, so we'll fill those in. And then we can build the rest of the content of the tree from the bottom up. Finally, for each node we can fill in a question that would create the correct split. What we have here is the best possible 20 question strategy for 15 items. We know we can guarantee a win in 4 questions because no path of the tree is longer than 4 jumps. Now a little bit of insight here will allow us to simplify the description of the strategy quite a bit. Let's take the first question here and rewrite it in terms of the numbers on the yes branch. The question is absolutely less elegant this way, but if we do the same thing to every question, all questions are now just variations of the same thing which is always a good sign. Now let's take the second layer of the tree and see what happens if we combine both questions into one. An answer of yes to this question means that we'll take the right branch, regardless of the answer to the first question. Similarly, the answer no means that we'll take the left branch. So just asking these two questions together is enough to know which of the four states we'll be in on the third layer. If we apply this process to every layer, we get the four questions that we can ask to know exactly what the secret number is every time. By applying the question duplication method from before, we can convert these four questions into a pretty good Ulam's game strategy. We simply ask our questions in pairs until the two answers we get back don't match. If this happens, we now know that a lie has been told, but we don't yet know what the true answer is. So we have to ask the question a third time in order to progress. From that point on, however, we know the lie has been used so we no longer have to duplicate the questions. With these seven answers, we can deduce that seven is the secret number and win the game. 
Of course, we're mostly interested in the worst case scenario for this strategy, which manifests itself when the responding player chooses to lie for the last question. This forces us to have to double ask the first three questions and then triple ask the fourth, resulting in nine total questions. We want to slim this down as small as we can get while still guaranteeing a win. To meet this goal, we might notice that the four original questions together amass information as quickly as questions can. Otherwise, they wouldn't be the best 20 question strategy. It's only when we start duplicating them that they start losing their potency. So let's go ahead and use these questions as a base. A sort of jumping off point, if you will. Let's say we ask just these questions and get these answers back. We know that if the responding player didn't lie, these questions are enough to narrow down the possibilities to just one answer. However, they could have lied for any one of the questions and we wouldn't be able to tell. If they lied for the first question, for example, the true set of answers would actually have the first answer flipped, and the secret number would be 5. If we do the same for the possibility of a lie on the second, third, and fourth questions, we see that we really only have 5 numbers left that could still potentially be the secret number. Of course, if they were to give a different set of answers, we'd have a different collection of 5 numbers. So just to make things a little bit more generic, let's assume we've asked our 4 questions, and we've analyzed in this way which 5 numbers are still possible. We'll call the number that would be the responder's number assuming they told the complete truth, T, and we'll call the other 4 possibilities A, B, C, and D. With only these numbers remaining, we can almost taste victory. But in order to make it all the way, we're going to have to pay a visit to our old friend. You guessed it, the binary search tree. Just like before, we start with one colored ball for each remaining possibility. I've colored our t-ball a bit differently since it represents the possibility of no lie being told yet. This means that if t is the responder's secret number, they could still potentially lie for whatever questions we ask next. However, if it's not the chosen number, the lie has already been told. Let's go ahead and ask our first question to see how this affects our tree. Maybe we ask if the number is T, B, or C. Now, when the responder answers, we have no way of knowing if the answer they give is the truth or not, but we can actually still glean information from their response. If the responder answers yes, for example, we know that the only way A or D could possibly still be the responder's chosen number is if they lied once in their first four questions and then lied again for the question we just asked. Since we know the responder can only lie once, we can rule A and D out as possibilities. Now, let's look at what happens if the responder answers no. Again, because the responder can only lie once, we can confidently rule out both B and C as possibilities. What's interesting here is that T is still a possibility, because if it's the chosen number, the responder didn't lie in the first four questions. This means they could have lied for their answer to this question. We'll add an extra t-ball and recolor it to blue to signify that we know for a fact the lie has been used. The game is now indistinguishable from 20 questions from this point on. Let's go ahead and complete this example strategy and see what we can discover. You might immediately notice that there's only one leaf containing a red t. This is because no number can ever satisfy both the yes and the no answer for any question without one of them being a lie. It can also be said, for the same reason, that every blue ball corresponds to exactly one leaf, so we can associate each of our starting balls to a leaf. The only complication with this is that every question we ask on a node containing a red ball produces an additional blue ball we didn't have before, and with it, an extra leaf. What this means is that the number of leaves in a tree is exactly equal to the number of starting balls, plus the number of questions in the path the red ball takes. With this information, we can do what we did before and build the shortest tree we can with the right number of leaves. We'll start by constructing a tree with 5 leaves, one for each of our starting balls. We'll then pick one of the shorter paths to contain the red tea leaf. Then, for every question along its path, we'll branch off a blue tea ball and follow it down to the shortest path we can. We'll need a leaf node to actually hold these additional balls so we'll create two splits for them. Now we can just fill in the rest of the leaves with our A, B, C, and D, and fill in the rest of the tree from there. Now, just like before, we simply fill in the proper questions to create these splits, and combine each layer into a single question to obtain the three best questions to ask. Combined with the four questions from before, we've now discovered the best Ulam's game strategy for 15 items. If we simply ask our first four questions to figure out what T, A, B, C, and D should be, 
we should then ask our three remaining questions to get the win. Remember that the question duplication strategy from before guaranteed us a win in nine questions, so we've shaved off two questions from our total. This doesn't seem like much, but this is because a 15 item category is quite small. So let's see what happens if we bump up the count. We see that if we increase the size of the category, the optimal strategy does better and better than the question duplication one. If you're interested in how I came up with these numbers without having to build a tree with a billion leaves, I've put my sources for this video in the description. It requires a lot more hefty mathematics than I was comfortable covering in a video targeted towards a more general audience, but if you're into that kind of thing, the resources are there. I hope you enjoyed this little adventure as much as I've enjoyed putting it together. I'll see you guys soon for the next video.